And so this is the second part. Previously, we did um, a symmetric cipher. Right? Um, we're going to see another symmetric cipher, the Enigma one. I think I did that briefly in class. So I'm going to look at that one. That's also symmetric. So let's uh, bring it up. Previously, I said uh, you can go to the start, go through um, the list. So my list here had classical, modern, and so in the classical list, I believe the Enigma is here as well. So this is something that was used um, during one of the world wars. Just bringing it up. Okay, so this is the famous Enigma. And that's the Enigma machine. So I can click it, um, expand, so this will make it full screen. And this would minimize it. Right? So I can click full screen. Right? And I can see um, that's the presentation layer, the settings. It gives me a key. Right? How to encrypt and how to decrypt. So using this key, someone can encrypt and decrypt and it was a mechanical machine so actually they've simulated all the different parts of it right and so you can actually play with okay what does the enigma do and it shows you what sort of substitution it does so it sort of it plays around moves the characters around in different ways and finally comes up with a way to map the characters right so and that's the log now let's um, go back Let's minimize this. Right. And let's play. I play, you can see what is. So let me see. How are you doing? So you can see the Enigma machine has done the translation kill X and PC. Now, the interesting thing about this machine is if I copy it. The output and bracket back the input. I it immediately does the cycle. I didn't even have to go through and uh, click encrypt decrypt. So some of the okay, so that's the settings. Right, you realize it doesn't. Let me stop this. It has encrypt decrypt, but there's also analyze. So encrypt and decrypt are the same thing, but analyze is different. So that's what you can. So I hit play. Let me minimize so you can see. Right, so it's doing some analysis. Right. So um, some of the encryption algorithms they have different characteristics. So with the Caesar cipher, you actually had to tell it um, because Caesar was going up and down, but the Enigma machine had a way to do the substitution. So even the input and output could be. Uh, sorry. It was doing analysis. Okay, I have to stop this. Analysis sometimes takes a very long time. Okay, let me go back. Encrypt, decrypt. It's really cool. Right, so things can sort of uh, move around in the cycle. All right. So let's look at um, one that's asymmetric. Right. So for asymmetric, we actually are going to look at um, some of the uh, popular ones through history. At the end of the slides, the slides are already up. Right. It talks about the history of encryption decryption. Right. Now I'm going through just the history so people can link it to what is happening in the lab. So DES was the first uh, encryption standard. Usually they, um, they have a competition, they ask for proposals, and people propose different algorithms. And so some of them may have been there that people didn't know about, but one of them becomes the dominant one, and that becomes an encryption standard. So this is the first one. Data encryption standard, 1970, and the first one. And the main issues were, well, at the time was really great, but at this point, it's been studied so long, people know about it, people have been trying to break it. And computers have gotten fast. So for um, a 56-bit key, if someone were trying to do brute force, um, 
So this, these are the different statistics. So for a 56 uh, bit key, these are all on the slides. You can just scroll down. I just jumped around just to show you it's there. So 56 bit key have 7.2 times 10 to the power 16. So those are how many things you'd have to try out. So this um, look to be great, but these days, as it says, if someone has time, um, they could probably crack it very quickly. So that was the first one they started with, the DES. That was one of the first standards. Doesn't mean encryption, decryption didn't exist. It always did, um, all the way from CSI, maybe even before then. Strange languages, strange ways to communicate and hide uh, communication, protect information, right? So. Um, Next came the triple DES, which was to apply DES three times. So that means you more or less are having uh, like three keys or two keys so that you use it interchangeably or um, maybe one is used twice. So the idea was if you use the key or two or three different keys, the entire length becomes longer. So instead of uh, 56, if you look at it, three DES, uh, that's triple DES, has 168. Right. And that means the key size has increased, that's 168, and now we have 10 to the power 15 keys. And that one hopefully will take people uh, much longer. Right. So uh, triple DES was actually, um, in terms of encryption, not too bad, right? but at least it was trying to solve some issues. Right. Now one of the issues that was there with... Um, Triple DES. I mean, DES was um, complex enough. Um, hardware, software, it was a lot of, it took a lot of computational power. But the other part was the block size. The block size was kind of small uh, and fixed. Right? So 3D has didn't really change the block size. Um, I think perhaps they could have. I, I can think of different ways they could have, but uh, they didn't really do so. Right. So uh, 3DS is there. So the second thing was okay, they had another round and advanced encryption standard came from, from data we're going to advanced right. and with the advanced one it's something that um, was in terms of computational power a little bit more efficient with memory hardware software right and it could use well 3 ds had a fixed number of blocks now a block is just how much data it's encrypting at a time so it was 68 blocks if you look at the sheet we had this is just we are just doing eight bits at a time Okay, maybe a little bit more than a little bit less than eight, but that's what we were doing. We didn't actually use all eight, but that's how much we're doing. So they were saying, well, can we not always just have um, 64? Can we have different sizes? So now with AES, you can do 128, 192. Um, those are different keys, and you also have a bigger block size. So they are now thinking, okay, we have different key sizes, we have a bigger block size. So and trying to um, crack it would be a little bit harder. So they increased the block size. And if you look at um, AES, it's there. it seems that the time required to crack it is a little, a little bit less. Um, but I think um, weighing the pros and cons of, um, how do I put it, how easy it is to encrypt, to decrypt the um, stress on hardware, putting all those together, AES has become one of those, but you remember AES also had three different ways to make the keys. There was a 128, that's easy to crack. But there's a 192 bit key and a 256 bit key. So this is a lot. So you realize that as the key size increases, using brute force to crack it becomes much harder. Right. So let's see DES in action um, using the crypt tools. Right. So I go back to the start menu and so asymmetric sorry all right des so des is currently here under symmetric here it is all right so des cipher that's the template you highlight you can give you the history of it let's click All right, so there are a lot of components on this, and that is the DES. All right, so it says, what do you want to do? It says, I want to decrypt. So let's pull this up, make it bigger. All right. 
so this these are the settings that's this one so it says you can encrypt decrypt and there are several modes so cipher block um, electronic code book now this is where they break it into blocks um, they can chain them you can get some feedback and so on but uh, feedback meaning that they can feed the information from one block into the other right um, padding so someone was asking what if the data uh, is too small there are some here some options you can do zeros you can um, put in some standards um, one zero padding so there are ways that um, they can do it and there's an option here for triple DES okay so let me turn that back off okay so let's go back to the menu right now this is the input and as you can see um, one of the things let's go to the presentation layer one of the um, the things that happens with some of these is they may actually give you um, this which which looks more like um, how do I put it? it it looks like a hex hex codes like bytes right and the way they normally accomplish this so I'm just explaining to you how they got this how they got this was they went to the tools menu um, and in the tools menu you will find this is important uh, I think right let me wish I could do this below okay, let me make another project well, maybe I don't have to but let's let's look at this right so if you look at the data that's in here over here it says um, text so it says that this thing is being turned into text right so if I play it okay it's gone so that is the, the information that's coming out it goes into A string decoder who changes it um, puts it into the DES so DES also has an input so he's expecting that one there's a key encoder and that means there's a key for it the key is also turned into a byte output right and then so the two things so the key is um, set up, put into a decoder, fed into the DES machine, right? The input is also fed in, and you are getting sorry, some output, which is the quick brown fox jumped over um, the lazy dog. So this is just some way. So that means if you wanted to play with it, maybe you could see what will happen if sorry. I was just playing around with the key and you realize that anytime someone messes with the key so it means imagine if you're trying to to guess what the key is right now you can see these um, these things warning about um, the key is not the right size it's going back to 100% so it means if you make mistakes with it so the DS had ex a specific size what they expected the key to be so it means if you didn't put in the right size of key had a fixed size key but uh, the key there could be so many of them so all the possible combinations and if someone was trying to uh, decrypt that means that you'll be playing around with different keys trying to decrypt the information right. so this is an example of um, the DES now the other thing I was um, trying to tell people about so I'll make a new project and show you how do they come up with these hex codes right you can come up with these hex codes I don't I don't know if that's in the um, in a template or not I don't know if it is but let's see it might be no they don't they don't really have it in there so I'll just do a small demo to discuss how it works right so this is a blank sheet right? I'm going to go to tools um, if I click it these are the different tools there is one for text input so I click oh it's still playing oh the playing is that why I can't okay I have to drag drop All right so that is my text input All right and this 
is a text output right and you can see the text input and text output looks similar only thing is how information comes in this guy if you hover on it sorry, tells you that this is for text that comes out as a string so I can type something like um, how are you right. now if I type something like that um, I will need to turn this into bytes so the hex codes that you were seeing before if you're wondering how do you do it you have to use an encoder decoder let me find it So it says, and you can see it's color coded. So it says, this is a text input. And so I can say, okay, from one. Sometimes when you're dragging it, it asks to create things for you. Um, so my machine is slowing down a bit. So. Okay, so I've been able to successfully connect it. And this is the presentation layer. So that means I'm, I'm chaining a few of them up around, trying to put them closer together. Sorry, I have to drag it this way. Um, I think if you've been working with um, different systems, sometimes you, you feel the urge to click somewhere and drag, but it may be wrong. This video is getting longer. I have to quickly try and wrap up. Okay, but let's try and finish this one. All right. So this is a string decoder. I'm also going to add a string encoder. So I'm doing the round trip. So it means I'm going to turn this text into hex code. Turn the hex code. Um, feed the hex code back into an encoder, which will turn it back into text for me. So um, if I play this, so watch. If I type, how are you? Right, that's the log it says no errors that's the data if I click stream output so data is like all these connectors stream output says this is what it's coming out of it this is the byte so there are two options stream and byte stream meaning it's coming out as characters byte meaning it's coming out as bytes and you have to actually pay attention to these bytes just mean stream means that um, the characters are actually coming out in in text form but byte means it's the raw data the raw that means the bits right. so um, looking at this you can see if I'm connecting them this one says stream output and you have here also stream output so please watch the colors All right this dark green that's dark green so it can sort of help you out so remember if I typed something like how right and this is uh, 48 and 48 is actually um, I think 65 in hex you can you can just um, convince yourself that's true and uh, try it out. Right, so, oh, sorry. That, that was in the, the hex code. I was trying to get A. It's not 65. Uh, let's go to output. So it's 41 and 65 in hex. So that's A, that's B. So A, B, C, D. So it's actually giving the hex codes. So, sorry about that. So A is uh, 41 and 41 is actually 65. Right, so... You can see we are almost done. Let's go to the final stage. Let's connect the stream output to the other stream output. And then finally, so let's play this again. Right. So this is, that's the information, that's the data. Let me go to the data for um, this one as well. And you can see it says A, B, C, D. So it means I can change a string into hex codes right and change the hex codes back into a string and if I wanted to view it instead of always having to click play well not just click play but click data I can connect it so now when I play the information goes from one end through this through this to there right so for example I can type something like um, trying to get um, something um, for one of these that means for some of them 
like this. Let's copy the information from this. Uh, sorry, this was my new project. So if I wanted to do something like that, that means sometimes you can have um, encoder, decoder, or decoder, encoder. So there are, there are many ways to go around this. If I wanted to turn those hex, so this is just my advice for you. Well, this experience. If I want to turn these hex right, back into strings, I actually have to go from the encoder to the decoder because now I'm going backwards. So that means this would feed into... Uh, that which would feed into this and come up. So one way is going from the raw data to the hex code, but note that for him, this one, right, when it's decoding, it has one of them that says stream input and one of them that says byte. So I'll have to take one of the outputs, connect it to the encoder so I can get back my data. So that's really how you can do it. Um, some of these are just giving you a few things, a few tips to how you can arrange things. But then you as um, the designer or a security expert now, I guess, or budding security expert, can arrange these. So you can expand, let me stop this. You can expand this and add in things yourself. Okay, so A lot of cool things okay let's uh, stop this I think the video is getting too long thank you very much for watching oh yeah in case you're wondering yes the triple DES is also there it was under the DES menu and um, under the modern you will find RSA There as well so the rsa sorry sometimes i have to expand these to see the full name so that's the decryption that's the encryption so they put in all the blocks that's the key generator so rsa um, is asymmetric so there's a key generator that will give you a modulo so these are numbers a public key sorry, and a private key so rsa does that for you and you realize that they're using the same key generator to connect to encryptor and decryptor right so let me play this very quickly same thing let me do how are you how are you right so you can see this is how are you output comes in this goes to the encryptor right and if I expand this and I pick data I think I'm clicking. Okay, here's the data part. Right. You can see the information that came in, what it said was a public key, the message, how are you, was what came in, and it encrypted it in, in some way. Right. Oh, sorry. Back to RSA. And let me minimize this. So this does the encryption, right? And here, this is just like what I was talking about. It, it can take something, you can connect something to more than one output. This is trying to encode it so we can see what the output will be. Of course, you can put your mouse over it and you can see DE, blah, blah, blah. But it's just showing you, yeah. So once connected to an output box, it can show you what is actually coming. So you don't have to highlight or put your mouse over it all the time. It just show you. And then there is a decryption part, so the same keys, and you can see RSA, when it's doing work, it has, you can connect and you can just read off, that's the public module, so that means everyone can know about the N, right? And for, if you look carefully at the diagram, right, there's a public exponent being connected here, right? And for one of them, so just watch, one of them takes the private key. And watch this one of them takes the private key so it's almost the same thing but the only thing is one time it's connected with the exponent the, uh, the public key and one time connected with sorry the private key right 
but still to the same info because it says this is where you should put your public or private key it says that you can put your message here if depending on the format so this is it's if you're uh, doing just integers or you are doing just um, this is a big int integer okay that's still that one uh, let's see so a big integer cipher text okay so the message one of the things I noticed about some of them like RSA is the message can come in either as a string like where like characters or it can come in as a number so if it's a number you're encrypting just the same way we're encrypting as one number at a time but we could actually put much of them together then you can have um, input into this one so you can encrypt and just do one number encryption like I want to encrypt the number 605 you could uh, connect it here um, there I think there's a number thing okay let me see though there used to be there was a number I know there was a number input called number you have gone past it I've seen this here before I think I've, I've gotten lost but anyway so if you are doing numbers you can do it here but most of the time you're doing text so it comes in here and then that means once it's encrypted if to decrypt I'll put that into the same message field now I'll put in what's coming here is the private key and then you can decrypt and then this is how are you right. now what I'll do here to show you um, the symmetric how symmetric is this I'm going to disconnect the way it's done and reconnect in a different way so in this way you can see the public key is being used first so that means the public guy encrypts it and then the private um, one decrypts it that's the current format how are you comes out how are you and if you didn't know the code you you get it wrong so let me stop this and let's do it what if instead of to remove this this was um, this connector so note that the lower one went to that one so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the lower one and move it to there and the upper one the public and move it to there so now I am simulating the private guy encrypts it the public guy decrypts it and you can see it's the same how are you right this is cool so the idea about um, what, what one of the benefits we talked about with asymmetric encryption is it's great if the public key when used you can then use the private key to decrypt it or you can use a private key to encrypt and the public key to decrypt and this is just showing you that yes it is possible right so you can actually swap them around right so hopefully I've shown you another um, thing about encryption decryption but this is with the asymmetric right and that's why we are saying if two people one knows the private one knows the public they sort of mutually know that the other person sent it if he can decrypt it same with the symmetric if two people have the same symmetric key when a message comes we know one of us sent it but we don't know really who sent it because it was the same key two people are suspects but with this one only one person is a suspect for an encryption or a decryption okay um, the last thing um, that we did in class so back to start center are the sweet hashes okay. shouldn't have said sweet right, but uh, let's go hash functions right and there are many of these um, CRC checks some codes MD5 some of them are dying out um, so for example there's an example with MD5 right? I just pick MD5 it's the one we didn't do in class I think in class with the shower one but let's see MD5 in action template for that right and what this means is there can be some information goes to the hash the hash is actually very simple right and if you expand it a bit and go to the settings, no settings, it's so everybody knows what a hash does, right? That's my input, that's um, the output. If I play it, um, I can go back to the screen and it's saying if I have a message, for example, uh, this is cool, you can see that the same message is. And it doesn't matter the length. That's the thing about the hash functions. We talk about the fact that a hash function, even one character, one, becomes this, right? Or two. 
and it doesn't matter how um, how long the input is the hash function always returns the same thing so sometimes what you can do is if you know what the length of the input is and you know what your result should be you can tell if someone sent you something that's fake so, but the good news is if I know the hash for something so for example if I have a message hello and uh, meet me at the back right and I send this message along with a hash right if someone changed even one character even added a dot what will happen is the whole hash changes and that's really how you're able to tell the integrity of something if, if the hash value changes then you know it's changed and then the other thing is I wanted to make sure that nobody was also messing with my hash output what people can do is they can also encrypt it meaning that only the person who receives and decrypts it can then use to check it and that's one of the things we're talking about during class and um, if you go to the remainder of the slides this is more or less everything um, that is there right so that's the hash right now the other thing about hash is it is uh, consistent across uh, different software so uh, let me just uh, pull out my sql Right, so this is MySQL Workbench, select version, just to show you. Alright, it says that's the version number. Right, and a lot of other programming languages, tools, databases, and so on. Okay, so this is MD5. How are you? Question mark. Right, and that's my result. 04, blah, 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 blah. Now, if I use the same how are you, So 04 E35E. 04 E35E. So that means it doesn't really matter the programming language or the system or the environment. So long as you've encrypted them the same way, or in this case hashed them the same way, you should have the same results both ways. Right? Of course, it also means that someone can be attacking a system with their own homebrew. They could have coded the algorithm themselves and have it in a loop doing something crazy. Right? So um, this is the hash, right? And that means if anything at all is changed, even if a space is added, space, right? You have a different hash function. Right? So that at least takes you through. So at the very least, um, for lab exercises, let's go back to the beginning. You should understand how symmetric encryption works. Right, and some of the characteristics, some of them go usually with block. Same with asymmetric, the, the how the private public key or half of the key, the other half of the key, how it works out, and hash functions, and what is really doing to you for messages. Right, so, um, wrapping up, sorry, going a little bit fast, I'm looking for the diagram for messages. So, for going for messages, I mean, if I take something and apply a hash function and give you a message with a changing code, right, it means if I send it to you. You can check to see if the message was original by checking to make sure that the message corresponds to the hash. By you would then calculate the hash yourself because you now have the message and compare. Right. When we add uh, symmetric or asymmetric encryption, it just means that when I calculate the hash, I encrypt it and send that along. That means that now people can easily mess with it. It's even more difficult to mess with a message. You have to decrypt it, um, figure it out. But now there are two levels of complexity. But the person who receives it would then, using the other part of the key, or if it's in the case it's symmetric, using the same key, decrypt it, calculate the hash on the message, and get an output. Right? And this is with a public private key, and it's very similar. You can see key on both sides, same diagram, just key on both sides. Right? So this was what we were supposed to finish out in class. Let me just go through. Um, this is another one where you, you put. Um, you add some information to the end so you can add the keys or some secret value to the ends of the message right so that means before I send it so some people call this salting I think that's a term that's come out these days where they say oh I salted the message sorting the message just means everybody knows the hash but if you don't know the salt so for example if I said I was sending someone a message and I said every time I send you a message at the end of the message I would put um, maybe uh, a special word like um, 
happen at the end. Right? That means that if someone didn't know the secret word I'm attaching to the end of it or to the beginning, he would never figure it out. He'd still say, Oh, the guy says this is the message. He would hash it and you get this. But because you and I would have agreed, so you can see when something is attached, we all agree that, oh, let's attach something to the end. And that would mean that when someone gets it, if he doesn't know about what we put at the end, even if he messes with the message or the hash, it's now much harder. I remember even one dot would change it. So um, this has been called sorting in recent times, but it's something that's always been there. It's something that we've all known. That if you have anything and you, you append something, it's going to change. So the principle has been there for a while. So again, you send the message, but when the person gets the message, he applies the sort or whatever you agree to append to both ends, performs the hash and compares to make sure that what was sent to him, the hash, matches what you computed. Right. So that is really um, the three ways in which messages um, can be protected. Of course, the message itself could also be encrypted or sometimes as well, there could be a counter, a sequence number. A sequence number just means that maybe it's telling you there's a first part, second part, third part. So when you get a message, you know the message is in pieces and it's coming in various parts. Or maybe we are communicating and our idea is we'll be exchanging numbers. I send you one, you send me two. I send you three, I send you send me four. And we, there can be a secret attachment within the messages going up and down. And if anybody messes with the message and the sequence is broken, so that means if we started from 4, and I know the next number should be 5, but you come to me with 10. I know that, oh, this message is in the original one. This is uh, the public um, public uh, digital signature. That's how applying public keys to this, right? So it means that, um, one, so someone has his information. He has a public key and information about the certification authority. And what you do is... He can um, unsign certificate contains all the information, hash it himself, encrypt it, and attach it to the end. So he's encrypted. So it's like you wrote a letter containing your information. So this is how signatures work. Your information, your public key, so that someone can verify, oh, is it really him? So the public key is part of it. And some certification authority, certification authority meaning maybe there's a bank. So maybe if it's in a school, then maybe... Um, the head of the department or the lecturer or some other authority could have encrypted it. So he says, that's my information, right? That's maybe details about my grades or something. I add my public key, meaning if you get, anytime you get the certificate, you can actually figure out if it's really belonging to me. And then certification authority, and then I encrypt it. And I encrypt it using my private key. So that means I've signed the certificate and that's the signature, All right? So the signature is just after I hash it, I sign it. Now, if someone wants to verify, right? Now, the certification authority, right, is there. But what will happen is the person can also hash it to see if the result he's getting is true. Right. So, um, the certification authority um, is the one. So, if my public key is in there, and the certification authority, maybe the lecturer has signed it for me. What the certification authority does was they put up their keys, their public keys. So it's almost like you wrote a letter, included your public key, um, and you sent it to me. And then you hashed it, and then you sent it to me. I then what? Encrypt it. Encrypt the hash that you gave with my private key. I'm the certification authority. Sometimes some people are their own certification authorities. But if you are not your own certification authority, um, some certification authority signed it. Now you have a signed certificate. I put out, that's the certification authority, puts out its public key. And then if anybody wants to verify, they can decrypt it and verify that, oh, the hash, so the hash is something that's known by both, like everybody. So you know it, the certification authority knows it, the public knows it. Everybody can find the hash. But what is different? Remember that even though something is hashed, the question is what if someone has changed it? But the only proof is if someone can say, I am an authority, I checked it out for you, and I verify that it's true, he signed it. Right. So um, self-signed uh, certificates are ones where the person is the same person who, after using this public key, would also use a private key to en encrypt it and say, oh, you can decrypt it or something. But um, if there's a certification authority, that means that once a message is put together, that certification authority signs it, and then you know it's true. Right. Um, the hash 
process um, just helps you make sure that the information is plain the idea of hashing is the information is not changed the hash just helps you confirm the information is true but by encrypting it and the pair that means that you are actually trusting that only the certification authority has the right to have signed it right he's the only person who has a key right. so if you go to um, a lot of websites right so this is just Google and um, this is verified by Google um, not working for them or anything I show you how it works that means that the browsers oh, so it says you have not said any permissions but if I go I can say well, I want to see what this is about more information and most browsers can give you information and say that's the website that's the owner this is the person who verified it. it doesn't have to be Google it could be someone else and you can say I want to see the certificate and says oh that's the certificate it just says okay he's filled in some details right and this you remember sha sha one that was a hash that means it's been hashed right and there is going to be um sorry a certification authority that's attached to it so it says you trust give uh, Google authority and so on so there's some information that the browser can use to go and find out oh you said Google has been signed by whoever the certification authority is and then you can go and get All right so it says this is Eugene Shawan it has the public key isn't this cool All right so the public key is there and tells you what the algorithm is it's RSA that's a public key and it means that someone can then verify this simply by applying um, the encryption to sorry by applying the encryption to the signature All right so this is Google let me pick another one um, for example Microsoft with HTTPS All right so that's it so the idea was that for the browsers what the browsers will do is anytime they check something and see that it's signed they make this green so that anyone looking at it knows it's true All right so human beings we don't have to keep clicking this and this one says verified by semantic let's open this and say more information and we'll do the same thing let's view the certificate right so it says for this one it's Microsoft Corporation he's filled in his details his serial number well, a whole lot of information his period of validity now period of validity means that even if um, like I wrote you a letter I, the letter I could have at the end as a date and I dated it and for the SSL certificate and so on what they do is people usually pay for these so you can pay for a year for a month and so on and so once you pay for it saying he's paid to be verified for this amount of time and that's the hash so that means they've hashed all of this and they get this result and it will tell you that's the fingerprint right? uh, sometimes they call the hashes fingerprints fingerprints meaning like if it wasn't you the, the fingerprint would be different now you can see here that it says very sign to Symantec to Microsoft right? and it says the certificate contains what was used this is the public algorithm for the person the person's public key that is the certification authorities right so it's saying some details about it not critical is not a set so Microsoft is not um, key usage so there are some details that go along with it some policies says what SSL is right so um, this is more or less how the certificate idea works certificate idea meaning somebody to certify you would encrypt on your behalf to say oh yeah you know what if it's been hashed and I encrypted a hash and so by encrypting the hash I verify that I am aware of what he's doing right and if you get it and you wanted to check you can use my public key to decrypt so that is more or less digital signatures it's not difficult it's just getting used to what the different things are used for right um, as I said before Diffie Hillman is used for sharing keys um, there are many ways you can also use RSA to help share your keys right um, but if a key is usually symmetric that means you have to have a way to share it right? so going off we said DES came keys were short a little bit difficult to encrypt went to triple DES more complex the keys are longer but then they wanted to have a way to encrypt with the same algorithm but in different ways and different lengths of key so um, 
A here is K, and it's now a standard. So this is just comparing um, the different sizes. So DES, triple DES, and AES, and you can see that for AES, the key size has been changing. Right. And this is showing you how long you take to crack one of them if you're using brute force. Right. And finally, I think this last part one slide. So I've actually gone through the slides, it's just an hour long. It includes also uh, the crypt tools. It shows you some key information. Um, this particular presentation is from the authors of the textbook. So RSA, when it was developed, what it's used for benefits. Diffie-Hillman Key Exchange is an algorithm for exchanging keys. And it also gives the details about that. Digital signature tells you what it does. Um, this one we haven't talked about, but I think um, you can read about it from the text. Elective Curve Cryptography. But it's also available in Crypt Tools, I believe, um, in case you want to play with. Sorry, it's not a hash function. Sorry. Let me try and search. Sometimes when you're trying to find, okay. Let's make sure I have the name right before I continue. Yeah, ECC, electric cap cryptography. So let's go back. Might be there. Maybe I'm not searching with, for it with the right name. Um, I think the only thing that's left out, I'm trying to remember, the only thing we haven't talked about is okay, um, the XOR thing, using the XOR. So let me see if I can. Okay, so XOR sci-fi is here. Remember in class I said it's also possible to generate many, many keys, right, so that you can encrypt. And this is an example, but it's just using one XOR. It's not using a whole bunch of XORs, right? So it's saying if I have this as my input and something to XOR with, so that's my result. So it does the same XOR. So XOR, it takes what you have. That's your key. That's an XOR. If I want to decrypt, I use the same key. Do another XOR. Is that cool? Right. And then I can have the same result. So anything I have, the XOR is used to both encrypt and decrypt. Now, um, the only thing about XOR is it's an easy operation. And I showed you how to do it in class. It's an easy operation. So we just have to make sure that if you're going to use XOR, we actually use a series of keys. right? And that is what um, usually people call stream cipher. So those block cipher, stream cipher. Stream cipher meaning um, as the information is coming, I'm using a series of keys usually to encrypt it. And it can be just as strong. Right. So um, actually, we've, we finished the slides. So I'm hoping that on Monday, people come in with questions and they try out the, the different algorithms I tried out as well. So they try out uh, SHA-1, MD-5. I'll include the list in this, the lab notes. Right. So for hash functions, MD5, SHA-1, please know how they work, what are they used for, what are, what are they good for, message identification and so on. Um, we look at a symmetric and asymmetric encryption. We we'll also look at using uh, the XORs. And of course, I just talked about, and that's what I think over the weekend you could spend some time on looking at digital signatures. But this is really the overview of the whole show. Right? So you must be comfortable with everything. Right. This is giving you a head start. You can start studying for uh, the quiz. I said I'll make it Wednesday so that Monday you can ask questions. Right. Thank you very much. 50 minutes, a bit long, but uh, hopefully it's been worth it. Thank you very much for watching. This is just uh, encryption or cryptography, not just encryption, cryptography. That means encryption, decryption with respect to computer security, different concepts.